All right, turn to Romans chapter 7. I'm going to finish the chapter this morning. Finally, I know. Romans chapter 7. I'm going to begin reading the passage at verse 7. Uh, to, to establish some context and then finish it out. So Romans chapter 7, beginning with verse 7. What then shall we say? That the law is sin, by no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet, if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. Apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but where the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and righteous and good. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me, through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. <coughs> so Romans 7 and, of course, this passage in particular really have been rather controversial amongst those who study the book of Romans. Uh, particularly, is who is he talking about? Who is this um, wretched man uh, that he mentions in verse 24 when he talks about, a wretched man that I am? Several views have been offered. Um, I'm not so sure how important this is to you, but let me just throw them out there, that Paul uh, when he's talking in this passage, he is referring to his pre-conversion days when he was a slave to sin, uh, before he was um, uh, relieved uh, or released from the law of sin, as he mentions in verse 6. So some say that this is Paul talking about what he was like before he became a believer. Some say that Paul speaks of himself in the days when the Holy Spirit was dealing with him before he became a Christian, as he says in Acts 24, uh, verse uh, 14, uh, as he gives his testimony to Agrippa, he says he heard this voice, and the Lord said to him, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. And so whatever that means, that apparently there was a time from between uh, when Paul was minding the clothes of those who stoned Stephen and the time that he was converted on his way to Damascus. Apparently during that time, there was a time of turmoil and conviction uh, referred to by that text as the goads, the things that kept prodding him. And so maybe he's speaking of those. 
Some think that Paul's speaking of a carnal Christian, a Christian in their immaturity, who has not reached that stage of maturity, or maybe they have not attained victory over sin. And of course, the fourth view is that this just speaks of the normal conflict of the Christian life. And I think a normal reading of this passage will show us that this is descriptive of the struggles that all of us face as we live the Christian life. Notice, if you look at this again, all of these verbs are present tense verbs. He's not talking about something that has happened. He talks about something that is ongoing in his life. And as he writes to these Roman Christians, there's no indication here that uh, anything uh, is out of the ordinary for any believer. It's not something that's unique to Paul as an apostle. Um, listen, if you think about your week last week, you will probably admit that you have experienced some of this. You've had a desire to serve God and to do something, but you find that there's something within you that fights against that and tugs and pulls you the wrong way. And in a very strange way, uh, that should be encouraging. The presence of conflict is an encouragement because it does indicate that there is a sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit going on inside of us. Because people that don't know anything about uh, the things of God, the people who don't have the Holy Spirit living within them, they don't care. But we care. We struggle. And that's an encouraging thing. Uh, to profess to be a believer and, and to practice sin continually, according to uh, 1 John 3, 6 and verse 9 and chapter 5, 18, says you cannot be a believer and practice sin continually without some kind of inward struggle. There's got to be something going on. So in this section, we learn about the reality of this conflict, and then he gives us some of the reasons for it. And here are the reasons for this conflict. And first of all, he tells us in verse 13 that death dwells within us. He said, did that which is good bring death to me? Did the law, which is holy and righteous and good, did it bring death to me? And he answers that very strongly. He says, by no means. If you're reading a King James Version, it says, God forbid. It's the strongest negation known in that language. You see, if we correctly understand the Bible's teaching on depravity, which is why that chapter 3 was, was lengthy and, and was important, if we understand that correctly, we know that there's nothing from the outside that brings death to us. It's already in there. It's like prego, right? It's in there. The law shows us the sinfulness of sin. It doesn't create the sin. The law shows us the wages of sin. The law doesn't kill us. So here's, here's an example. And really, that's an extension of God's grace and mercy to show us that. So, <clears throat> so you have an MRI, and the MRI reveals a tumor, and it's a tumor that can be removed. Now, um, if you don't know it's there, if it was never discovered, and it was never treated, it may grow, and it may kill you. But you see it because you had an MRI, but the MRI doesn't create the tumor. It just shows it. It just reveals it. And you might, when you find out, you might have wished, maybe I wish I didn't have the test. Maybe I wish I didn't know it was there. But the test didn't cause the condition. The law doesn't cause the sin. The sin is already there. The law <coughs> reveals the sin that's already within. And it points us to the treatment, which is not the law. It's not the MRI machine doesn't treat you. It only shows you. And the treatment, of course, is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is Paul's experience, as he says in verses 8 through 11. 
in his self-righteousness as a Pharisee. He thought he was in good standing with God. He thought he was alive. But then the law showed him the sinfulness of sin and put his self-righteousness to death. He, he pulls out that, that commandment about coveting. And perhaps uh, that was an issue that was uh, particularly sensitive in Paul's life. He says, uh, I never even thought about coveting. And then the law said, do not covet. And boom, all of a sudden he realized, I'm, co I'm covetous. I'm a sinner. The law didn't create it. The law showed it. The law shows us our inability to obey God's righteous demands. So as long as, long as Paul thought he was right, he was on his way to destruction, but he wasn't right. Verse 11 said he was deceived by sin in thinking that he measured up to God's standards. So when he understood the intent of the law, it was good, and it drove him to Christ. So death dwells within. Secondly, verses 14 through 20 tells us that depravity dwells within. Why does somebody as godly as Paul, I mean, think about this guy. Think about everything that he had experienced in his life. Think about what he did for the sake of the gospel. I mean, I don't think any of us uh, were witnessing to somebody and had a whole town come and stone us, thinking we were dead and dragging us out and just leaving our bodies laying out in the street. I don't think any of us experienced that, but Paul did. And yet here's a godly man, and he's struggling with his own actions. And that's a real struggle. And we'll all confess that's true if we're honest with ourselves. And it's expressed in verses 16 and 17. He says, uh, I, 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 if I do what I want, I, I agree with the law that it's good. And uh, he says, I'm, I'm going back and forth. I do the things that I hate. But it's not really I, but it's a sin which dwells within me. But in a sense, it is the I who does that. You know, people say, well, you know, it's like that. <clears throat> it's like the black dog and a white dog. We all, got, we all have that in there. And um, whichever one you feed is the one that's going to be the strongest. Well, that ain't necessarily true. I don't know that Paul fed his flesh, and yet he still had this struggle. It was real. And the reason I think for this is even though we have been made righteous by the merits of Jesus Christ, there is yet within us remaining sin that will plague us until we are glorified. We are, because of our position in Christ, wholly sanctified. But we are not sanctified wholly. We are completely right with God in our position, but in our practice, we are far from that. We are still progressing in faith. We are growing in grace, and we are maturing in our walk. But verses 21 to 25, Paul tells us that desire also dwells within. This demonstrates for us that Paul speaks, I think, of the Christian experience. Nobody who's unconverted has that inner desire to conform to the law of God. I mean, certainly no unsaved person could say uh, what Paul says in verse 22, I delight in the law of God in my inner being. No unsaved person can say that. So here's a <clears throat> unsaved people rebel against God's law. They they try to rationalize their behavior relative to God's law. They despise his law, and they despise his authority. So here's a strong desire. It's a desire planted within every believer when we become a new creature in Christ. And, we, and, and because of that desire, we, like Paul, cry out for ultimate deliverance. Who will deliver me? If you're a believer and you struggle with this, there are those times when you think, man, I just wish this would be over. Not that, you're, not that you have a death wish or anything, but you just wish the struggle would be over. I wish the, um, I wish the anxiety would go away. I wish the temptations would drop off. I just wish it would stop. It will someday, 
when we are conformed to the image of Christ. So let me just give a few words of application here because this passage deals with an important issue. How are we to deal with this struggle of sin? Because we, we experience it. And so what do we do, what do, we do about it? How do we, how do we process this? Well, the, the problem has been approached in, in a lot of different ways. Uh, a couple that I'm going to mention. <clears throat> Some people have tried to approach this struggle with inner sin by saying, oh, we need a formula. That's what we need. And that'll take various forms uh, depending upon what is popular. It might be a book that you read that will have the secret of successful Christian living. And it's a secret. You don't know it until this person writes this book and tells you about it. And it may be something else. It may be another kind of formula, maybe a set of, of regulations, you know, like don't do this, don't do that, um, you know, don't, uh, well, when I was younger, don't go to movies, uh, don't, don't use tobacco, don't hang out with girls that do that. Um, it may take the form of clever slogans. I've heard some of these things, you know, <clears throat> let, just let go and let God. What does that mean for crying out loud? Um, or just let Jesus take control. Yeah, well, that's the problem. That's what I'm struggling with. Or I've heard people say, well, you know, you just need to get out of Romans 7 and get into Romans 8. Okay, fine. I'll flip the page, you know. Or you just need to get self off the throne of your life. Yeah, that's the whole struggle here. That's what the deal is. That kind of attitude just kind of reduces the, the, the conflict involved in the Christian life to a simplistic and unrealistic set of mottos and slogans. I'm sorry, but you can't get help in living the Christian life from a bumper sticker. So we don't need those kind of formulas. Well, some people say, well, no, no, you need an experience. That's what we have to have. And it takes different forms depending upon our backgrounds. <laughs> for some people, it may be a charismatic experience that, that culminates in, in the gift of tongues because that maybe is the, uh, the height of spiritual experience. And you really can't know victory until you get to that place. Uh, for some people, it may be some other second work of grace that results in complete sanctification. I think I've told you this before, but when I used to work for a courier service, one of my co-workers uh, from another town, we'd met at a terminal, and he, he, I, we struck up a conversation, and he believed that he had achieved the place of sinlessness, which I thought was very curious. I'd never met a person like that before. And he said, he says, yes, he says, I, I, I no longer sin, which probably was a sin in saying that. I said, oh, I said, so, uh, so then you're perfect. He goes, oh, no, no, no. I, I make mistakes. I thought, aha. I said, we're, we're just redefining terms here. That's all we're doing. But there are those who say that you can get to that place where you can become completely sanctified and sinless in this life. That was the, the old holiness movement. And that usually results from a crisis experience, a um, they used to call it praying through, but it requires a redefinition of sin and holiness and all of those things. Uh, it may be uh, a less dramatic experience uh, that some people call rededicating your life. I mean, I grew up with that. Uh, kind of like a, a, a Baptist equivalent to a second work of grace where... You, you have to deal with your unconfessed sin in a public setting. And uh, usually it's for, the, it's usually it's for the, the benefit of the guy that's preaching. When he gives a public altar call and an invitation and nobody flocks to the front, then he turns on the rededication sign and invites you to come to be rededicated because certainly there's got to be something in your life you need to deal with. So if you come to the front 
and you have some kind of an emotional crisis experience and it's public, you go on record. And that's the key to dealing with this struggle in the Christian life. It's pretty interesting that given what he says about his inward struggle here, Paul doesn't call for any of these kinds of things. Uh, although a lot of people would have, would have it, uh, encouraged Paul to come forward and rededicate his life. Um, so there's that. But then there's some people that just avoid the issue completely. I mean, don't even think about it. Fill your mind with entertainment or activities or whatever. Um, and sometimes they can even be church or Christian activities. Uh, some people have immersed themselves in, in working at the church to the extent that they have convinced themselves that that is what they need uh, for spiritual growth. I was in a church one time, and they had a little motto, and this was the key to spiritual growth. Because they, had, they met on Sunday mornings, and the church met on Sunday evenings, and that church met, had a midweek service on Wednesday. And so the pastor there would say, you know, if you want to be successful in the Christian life, you need three to thrive. So you go to church on Sunday morning and Sunday evening and Wednesday evening, and you will thrive as a Christian. That's what will give you spiritual growth. Well, it's okay. It's good to be uh, in the fellowship of the saints, but those things don't always work. So how do we address, how do we address this problem then? Let me just give you <clears throat> a, few, a few points here. Uh, first of all, just embrace, embrace the reality of the struggles. When we are called to Christ, we are called to a constant spiritual warfare in this life. That's the reality. Uh, unfortunately, the, the rapid rise of this prosperity gospel has pretty much nearly eliminated the idea of conflict from our understanding of the Christian life. And maybe it's a Western culture type thing as well where we think we need to have everything uh, easy for, for us. J.C. Ryle, who wrote in 1883, said that sanctification does not prevent one from having a great deal of sp inward spiritual conflict. And sometimes we're discouraged by the presence of struggles. But that doesn't mean that you're not sanctified. Rather, it's a pretty good indication that you are in the process of being sanctified because you are struggling. Unconverted people have no conflicts about living for God. They don't care. It doesn't come up on their radar. But believing people <coughs> struggle with it. They want to. So embrace the reality of that. Secondly, realize that there's no simple fix. We're always looking for those things. And there is no simple fix. Um, the, the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints has been lost to modern Christians. That says that even though we are met with trial and tribulation and spiritual conflict and the constant battle with remaining sin, true believers will struggle, but they will persevere in holiness. Um, that's our nature that we want the line of least resistance. That's appealing to us. So instead of the perseverance of the saints, we have substituted the idea of the preservation of the saints, that God will keep us. And that's true, he will. It is true that we are preserved in the faith by the Holy Spirit. But the outworking of that is called perseverance. In the Bible, living for Christ is depicted as striving as laboring. Isaac Watts wrote um, in a hymn. <clears throat> I don't know, you remember when we used to sing hymns in church? Man, I miss those days. Isaac Watts wrote a line, Shall I be carried to the skies <clears throat> in flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sail through bloody seas? It is a warfare. It is a struggle. And we persevere in that. 
we do make progress in holiness. It's like walking against the current, but we're moving and we're making progress. We're not going with the flow, we're going against the flow, but we're moving. And then thirdly, understand the nature of the Christian walk. I think there's a misunderstanding about the Christian life in that we have an attitude towards sin that is more self-centered than it is God-centered. I mean, we're more concerned about our own victory over sin than the fact that our sins grieve the heart of God. We're more concerned about the consequences of our sin relationally than we are the fact that sin is an affront to a holy God. Um, don't worry about victory, whatever that is. And how do we ever get that terminology in our Christian life? I don't know. But don't worry about getting victory over sin because here's what's going to happen. About the time you think you have it, you don't. I remember a guy here years ago <clears throat> who came, found Christ, and was in what was then called the program, uh, the equivalent of an academy, and he went through it. And of course, you know, his, his uh, problem was he, he had been an addict. And he says, God's delivered me from my addiction. Now I'm going to go back and tell my buddies. Everybody says, don't do that. But he was convinced that he had victory over that. Died of an overdose. Get this idea of victory, because you don't have victory in this life. Don't worry about that. We imagine that living by faith requires no effort on our part. And some people think, well, you know, the, the, the struggle, it shows how weak I am in faith. Listen, it's okay to struggle. Um, the Christian life is not always an emotional high. I mean, the people who are always up kind of irritate me. But we like those mountaintop experiences, you know. But if you have family in West Virginia, you realize that people don't live on the mountains. They live in the hollers. You can't live up there. Nobody lives up there. But you live in the valleys. And that's where we live. We often live in the valleys. It's kind of nice to go up there every now and again <laughs> and check out the view and enjoy the fresh air. But pretty soon you're going to be back down in the valley. And that's how the Christian life works. That's the nature of the Christian life. And then fourthly, don't neglect the means that God has ordained that by which we should grow in grace. And we know what those are. Those are the word of God, prayer, prayer, the fellowship of the saints, the ministry of the church. These are the things that God has given to help us to grow. Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 3, that God has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And then he goes on to say, so he has given you, to the, given you this, so add to that this and add to that this. So we have to diligently employ those means. And that's how we deal with this inward conflict. So as we grow in holiness, as we grow in the knowledge of God, um, sometimes there appears to be a gap in, in what we know and how we live. And sometimes in how we feel. Listen, feelings are liars. Don't trust them. But this is the dilemma of Romans 7. And this is the gap that he expresses at the end of Romans. But then he transitions to a word of great encouragement in chapter 8. And we'll look at that uh, next week. Father, thank you for helping us in this passage to realize that this is a struggle. Uh, and we believe, but help our unbelief. May we trust you completely utilizing the means whereby you've given us to, to grow, not being discouraged by the, the conflict and the struggle, but persevering to the end, um, walking by faith and not by sight, 
And may we trust in your word and in the provision of your Holy Spirit. And so help us today to do this in Jesus' name. Amen.